Okay. I'll talk about the sequel. But I'll start also with a little bit of history and sort of go through some of the things that uh, Jeff just mentioned. So Jeff talked about, uh, about supervised running, and supervised running works amazingly well if you have lots of data. Uh, we all know this, so we can do speech recognition, we can do uh, image recognition, we can do face recognition, we can, do, we can generate captions for images, we can do translation. That works really well. Um, and if you give your neural net a particular structure, something like a convolutional net, uh, as, as Jeff mentioned, in the late 80s, early 90s, we could uh, train systems to recognize handwriting that was quite successful. Uh, by the end of the 90s, a system of this type that I built at Bell Labs uh, was reading something like 10 to 20% of all the checks in the US. So uh, a big success, even a commercial success. But, that, but by that time, the entire community had basically abandoned neural nets partly because of the lack of large data sets for which they could work, partly because the type of software at the time that you had to write was fairly complicated and it, uh, it was a big investment to, um, to, to do this, partly also because computers were not fast enough for uh, all kinds of other applications. But convolutional nets really are inspired by uh, biology. They're not copied in biology, but there is a lot of inspiration from, from biology, from the architecture of the visual cortex, and ideas that come naturally when you study signal processing, the idea that filtering is, is a good way to kind of process uh, signals, whether they are audio signals or image, image signals, and that convolutions is a way to do filtering is very natural, and the fact that you find this in the brain is really not that surprising. Um, and those ideas, of course, were uh, proposed by Hubo and Weasel in sort of classic work in neuroscience back in the 60s, as well as uh, and, and sort of picked up by uh, Fukushima, who is uh, a Japanese re researcher who tried to uh, build computer models of uh, the, the Hubble and Weasel model, if you want. And I found that inspiring and, and sort of tried to reproduce this using uh, neural nets that could be trained with backpropagation. That's basically what a convolutional net uh, is. And so the idea of a convolutional net is that uh, the, the world, the perceptual world is uh, compositional, that the the visual world, objects are formed by parts, and parts are formed by motifs, and motifs are formed by uh, textures or elementary combinations of edges, and edges are formed by, by pixels, arrangements of pixels. And so if you have a system that sort of hierarchically can detect uh, uh, unusually useful combinations of pixels into edges and edges into motifs and motifs into parts of objects, then you will have a recognition system. This idea of hierarchy actually goes back a long time. And so that's, uh, that's really the principle of, of convolutional nets. And it turns out that um, hierarchical representations are good not just for, for vision, but also for speech, for text, and for all kinds of other natural signals that are comprehensible because they are compositional. Um, I think there is this saying, uh, it's attributed to Einstein, I believe, the, uh, what is most uh, mysterious about the world is that it is understandable. And it's probably because of the compositional nature of, uh, of, the natural, of natural signals. So uh, in the early 90s, we were able to do things like build recognition systems like this one. This is a younger version of myself here. Uh, I'm at Bell Labs. This is, by the way, my phone number at Bell Labs in Homedale, no longer operating. I'm hitting a key here, and the system captures an image with a video camera, this runs on the PC with a special DSP card in it, and it could run those convolutional nets at you know, several hundred characters per second at the time, which was amazing. We could run 20 megaflops. You know, that was just incredible. So that worked really well. And uh, pretty soon we realized we could use this for natural images as well to do things like detecting uh, uh, faces, eventually detecting pedestrians. That took um, a few years. Uh, but as uh, Jeff mentioned, there was sort of a neural net winter between the mid-90s and the uh, sort of late 2000s, if you want, where uh, almost nobody was working on neural nets except a few crazy people like us. Um, so that didn't stop us. And so uh, working on face detection, pedestrian detection, even working on uh, using machine learning and, and convolutional net for uh, robotics, where we, we would use a convolutional net to label an entire image in such a way that uh, every pixel in an image would be labeled as to whether it's traversable or not traversable by a robot. 
And the nice thing about this is that you can, uh, you can collect data automatically. You don't need to manually label it because uh, using stereo vision, you can figure out if uh, a pixel sticks out of the ground or not uh, using 3D reconstruction. But unfortunately, that only works at short range. So if you want a system that can plan long range trajectories, then you can train a convolutional net to make the predictions for traversability using those labels and then uh, let the, the robot drive itself around. So it's got this particular robot here as a combination of different uh, uh, features that it uses um, uh, extracted by the convolutional net and uh, also a, a, a rapid stereo vision system that allows it to avoid obstacles such as Pesky graduate students. Uh, Pierre Sermane and Raya Hatzel, by the way, who are pretty s sure the robot is not gonna run them over because they actually wrote the code. Um. Okay, and then a couple of years later, we uh, used a very similar system to do semantic segmentation. This is actually the work that uh, Jeff was talking about that was rejected from CVPR 2011. Uh, so this is the, a system that could, in real time, using a FPGA implementation, uh, segment, you know, basically give uh, a, a, a category for every pixel in an image um, at, at about 30 frames per second at sort of decent resolution. It was far from perfect, but it could sort of label with sort of reasonable accuracy, detect pedestrians, detect the roads and the trees and et cetera. Um, but the results basically were not immediately believed by the uh, computer vision community. Now, to measure the progress that has happened uh, since then, in the last 10 years, essentially. Uh, this is an example of a result of a very really recent system that was put together by a team at Facebook um, that they called the Panoptic Feature Pyramid Network. So it's basically a large convolutional net that has uh, sort of a, a path that extracts features, um, multi-layer path that extracts features, and then another path that sort of generates an output image. And the output image basically identifies and generates a, a mask for every instance of every object in the image and tells you what category they are. So here the name of the categories are not displayed, but it can recognize something like a few hundred categories, people, vehicles of various kinds, uh, and not just object categories, but also sort of background uh, uh, sort of textures or regions, things like you know, grass and sand and uh, trees and things like that. So you would imagine a system like this would be very useful for things like self-driving cars if you have the complete segmentation identification of all the pixels in an image, uh, it would make it easier to build self-driving cars. Not just, not just self-driving cars, but also medical image analysis system. So this is a relatively similar architecture. People call this U-net sometimes because of the obvious U-shape of this, uh, of this uh, conventional net. Again, it has uh, an encoder part that sort of extracts features and then a, a sort of a part that constructs the output image where the, the parts of the uh, medical images are, are segmented. This is the kind of result that it's producing. Uh, this is some work by uh, some of my colleagues at NYU. I was not involved in this work. Uh, this, uh, a different subgroup of colleagues with some common co-authors has worked also on uh, detecting breast cancer from, from imaging, from, from uh, x-rays, uh, from mammograms. Uh, in fact, one of the most sort of hottest topics in uh, in, in uh, radiology this, these days is using deep learning for uh, medical image analysis. It's, a, it's probably going to affect, if not revolutionize, uh, radiology in the next few years. It's already, it already has to some extent. Uh, so more work along those directions. Uh, this is uh, actually a collaboration between the NYU Medical School and Facebook Air Research in accelerating the data collection for MRI. So when you uh, go through an MRI, you have to sit in the machine for about an hour or 20 minutes, depending on the kind of exam you're going through. And uh, this uh, technique here, using those kind of uh, reconstruction uh, conventional net, allows to basically reduce the data collection time and get images that are essentially of the same quality. Um, so that will not put radiology out of jobs, um, but it will make the job more interesting, probably. Um, Jeff was mentioning uh, work on uh, translation with, with neural nets. This is, uh, I think, a, a very surprising and interesting development of the fact that you can use neural nets to do translation. Um, and th there is a, a lot of innovation in the kind of architectures that are used for this. So uh, Jeff talked about the attention mechanism, the transformer architecture. This is uh, a new one called dynamic convolutions, which kind of recycles a bit of those ideas. And, and things work re uh, really well there. Those networks are very large. They have 
a few hundred million parameters in them. And so the, the, some of the challenges there is actually running them uh, on, on GPUs, having enough memory to run them. We're basically limited by uh, GPU memory there. So those ideas of image segmentation have been used by uh, people working on self-driving cars, particularly uh, people at Mobile Life, going, uh, which is now uh, Intel, going back several years. Uh, those, the first convolutional nets, I think, that were deployed for self-driving cars or for driving assistance were in the uh, 2015 uh, Tesla S model. NVIDIA has uh, devoted a large uh, set of efforts also to self-driving cars. And so there's a lot of interesting things going on there. But progress is, uh, I wouldn't say slow, but auto completely autonomous driving is a hard problem. It's not as easy as people thought initially. OK, so um, Jeff uh, kind of brushed away reinforcement learning. But reinforcement learning is something that a lot of people are really excited about, particularly people at DeepMind. Um, but there is a problem with the current crop of reinforcement learning, which is that it's extremely data inefficient. If you want to train a system to do anything using reinforcement learning, it will have to do lots and lots of trial and errors. So for example, to get a machine to play Atari games, classic Atari games, to the level that any human can reach in about 15 minutes of training, uh, the machine will have to play the equivalent of 80 hours of, of real-time play. Um, to pl uh, play uh, Go at a uh, superhuman level, it will have to, to play something like 20 million games. To play StarCraft, this is a recent DeepMind uh, work. Um, it's a blog post, not a paper. Uh, the Alpha Star system uh, took the equivalent of 200 years of uh, real-time play to reach uh, human level on a single map for kind of a single type of player. Um, by the way, all those systems use ComNets and various other things, but uh, that's an interesting thing. So the problem with reinforcement learning is that those, those models have to try something to, to know if it's going to work. And it's really not practical to use in the real world if you want to train a robot to grasp th uh, things or you want to train a car to drive itself. So, you know, to figure out, um, to train a system to drive a car so it doesn't run off cliffs, it will actually have to drive to, you know, it will actually have to run off a cliff multiple times before it figures out how not to do that. First of all, to figure out it's a bad idea, and second, to figure out how not to do it. Because it doesn't have a model of the world. It, doesn't, it can't imagine what's going to happen before it happens. It has to try things to correct itself. That's why it's so inefficient. So that begs the question, how is it that humans and animals can learn so efficiently, so quickly? We can learn to drive a car. Most of us can learn to drive a car in about 20 hours of training with hardly any accident. How does that happen? We don't run off cliffs because we have a pretty good intuitive physics model that tells us if, I turn, if I'm driving next to a cliff and I'm turning the wheel to the right, the car is going to run off the cliff, it's going to fall, and nothing good is going to come out of this. Okay. So we have this internal model. And the question is, how do we learn this internal model? And, then, and the next question is, how do we get machines to learn internal models like that? Basically just by observation. So there is... Uh, um, a gentleman called Emmanuel Dupoux in Paris is a developmental uh, psychologist. Um, he works actually on how children learn language and speech and things like that, but also other concepts. And he made this chart about the time, uh, the, the age in months at which babies learn basic concepts, like things like uh, distinguishing animate objects from inanimate objects. That happens really quickly around three months old. Uh, the fact that uh, some objects are, are stable, some of them will fall. Uh, and you can sort of measure whether babies are surprised by the behavior of some objects. And then it takes about nine months for babies to figure out that objects th that are not supported will fall, basically gravity. So if you show a six-month-old ba six baby the, the, the scenario on the top left where there's a little car on a platform and you push the little car off the platform and the car doesn't fall, it's a trick. Babies six months old don't even pay attention. That's just another thing that the world throws at them that they, you know, they have to learn. It's fine. A nine-month-old baby will go like the little girl at the bottom left. Be very, very surprised. In the meantime, they've learned the concept of gravity. And nobody has really told them what gravity is. They've just kind of observed the world and they've figured out objects that are not supported just fall. And so when that doesn't happen, they get surprised. 
How does that happen? It's not just humans. Animals have those models too. You know, cats, dogs, rats, orangutans. So here is a baby orangutan here. It's being shown a magic trick. Put an object in a cup. Um, remove the object, but it doesn't see that. Then show the cup. It's empty. It was on the floor laughing. <laughs> so his model of the world was violated, right? He has a pretty good model of the world. Object permanence, that's a very basic concept. Objects are not supposed to disappear like that. Um, and when your model of the world is being violated, you pay attention because you're going to learn something about the world you didn't know. Uh, if it really violates a very basic thing about the world, it's funny. Uh, but it's also it might be dangerous, right? It might, it's something that can kill you because you, you just didn't predict what's, uh, what, what just happened. Okay, so what's the salvation? Really, you know, how do we get machines to learn this, this kind of stuff? You know, learn all the huge amount of background knowledge we learn about the world by just uh, observing in the first few months of life. Uh, and animals do this too. So, for example, if I ask you, um, if I train myself to predict what the world is going to look like when I move my head slightly to the left, because of parallax motion, objects that are nearby and objects that are far away won't move uh, the same way relative to you know, my, my, uh, my viewpoint. And so the best way to predict how the world is going to look when I move my head is to basically represent internally the notion of depth. And conse consequently, sort of conversely, if I train a system to predict what the world, what the world is going to look like when it moves its camera, maybe it's going to learn the notion of depth automatically. And once you have depth, you have objects, because you have objects in front of others, you have occlusion edges. Once you have objects, you have you know, things you can influence and things that can move independently of others and things like that. So concepts can kind of build on top of each other, each other like this through um, prediction. So that's the idea of self-supervised learning. It's prediction and reconstruction. I give the machine a piece of data, let's say a video clip. I mask a piece of that video clip, and I ask the system to predict the missing part from the part that it, it can observe. Okay, so that would be video prediction, just predict the future. Um, but the more general form of self-supervised learning is I don't specify in advance which part I'm gonna mask or not. Uh, I'm just gonna tell the system I'm gonna mask a piece of it, and whatever is masked, you, I'm asking you to re reconstruct it. And in fact, I may not even mask it at all. I'm just gonna virtually mask it and just ask the system to reconstruct the input under certain constraints. So the advantage of this self-supervised learning is that it's not task dependent. You get the machine to learn about the world without training it for a particular task. And so you can learn just by observation without having to interact with the world, which is much more efficient. But more importantly, you're asking the system to predict a lot of stuff, not just a, a value function like in reinforcement learning where basically the only thing you give the machine to predict is a, a scalar value once in a while. Not reinforcement, not uh, supervised learning where you ask the system to predict uh, a label, which is a few bits. In the case of self-supervised learning, you're asking the machine to predict a lot of stuff. And so that led me to this slightly obnoxious analogy, at least for people who work on reinforcement learning, um, which is the idea that if intelligence or learning is a, is a cake, the bulk of the cake, the génoise, as we say in French, uh, is really self-supervised learning. Most of what we learn, most of the knowledge we accumulate about the world is learned through self-supervised learning. Um, there's a little bit of icing on the cake, which is supervised learning. We're you know, being showed a picture book and we're being told the name of objects and with just a few examples, we can uh, know what the objects are. Um, we're, we're taught the meaning of some words and you know, babies can learn, uh, young, young children can learn many, many words per day, new words. And then the cherry on the cake is reinforcement learning. It's, it's a very small amount of, re of information you're asking the machine to predict, and so there is no way that the machine can learn purely from, from that form of learning. It has to be a combination of uh, probably all three forms of learning, but, but principally um, self-supervised learning. This idea is not new. A lot of people have argued for the idea of prediction, for, uh, for learning, the idea of uh, learning models, um, predictive models, and uh, uh, one, one such person is, is Jeff, as a matter of fact. This is a quote from, from him, uh, which, you know, this is from a few years ago, but he's been saying this for about 40 years, at least for 
longer than I've known him. Um, and, and it goes like this. The brain has about 10 to the 14 synapses, and we only live about uh, 10 to the 9 seconds. So we have a lot more parameters than data. This motivates the idea that we must do a lot of unsupervised learning or self-supervised learning, since the perceptual input, including proprioception, is the only place where we can get 10 to the 50 dimensions of constraints per second. If you're asked to predict everything that comes into your, sense, your, 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 your senses, uh, you know, every fraction of a second. That's a lot of information you have to learn, and that might be enough to constrain all the synapses we have in our brain to learn things that are meaningful. So the sequel of deep learning, uh, in my opinion, is self-supervised learning. And in fact, historically, as Jeff mentioned, the, the, the sort of deep learning conspiracy that, that Joshua, Jeff, and I started in the early 2000s was focused on unsupervised running, unsupervised pre-training. And it was partly successful, but we kind of put it uh, on the back burner for a while, and it's coming back to the fore now. It's gonna create a new revolution, at least that's my prediction, and the next, the revolution will not be supervised. So I have to thank uh, Alyosha Efros for this slogan. He invented it. Uh, of, of course, he got inspired by Jill Scott Heron, you know, the revolution will not be televised. You can even get a t-shirt with it now. Um, so what is self-supervised learning really? Self-supervised learning is filling in the blanks. Uh, and it works really well for natural language processing. So natural language processing, uh, a method that has become standard over the last year uh, in models like BERT and, and others, is you take a, a long uh, sequence of words extracted from a corpus of, of text, you blank out uh, some proportion of the words, and you train a very large neural net based on those transformer architectures or various other architectures to predict the missing words. And in fact, it cannot exactly predict the missing words, so you're asking it to predict the distribution over the entire vocabulary for the probability that every, you know, each word may, may occur at, at, at those locations. Um, so that's called, that's a special case of what we call a masked autoencoder. Okay, give it an input, ask, ask it to reconstruct. So there's part of the input that, are not, that is not present. People have been trying to do this in the context of image recognition as well. There's, there's various attempts at doing this. So uh, this is work from uh, Patak et al. Uh, from a few years ago where you blank out some pieces of an image and then you ask the system to fill, it, to fill them in. And it's only partially successful, not nearly as successful as in the context of natural language processing. So natural language processing, there's been a revolution over the last year of using those pre-training systems for natural language understanding, translation, all kinds of stuff, and the performance is amazing. It, they're very, very big models, but the performance really works really well. And there were sort of early indications of this uh, in work that uh, uh, Yoshua Benjo did uh, a long time ago in the 90s, and uh, Ronan Colbert and Jason Weston did in the, uh, around 2010 uh, in uh, using neural nets for NLP. And then more recent work, word 2 vec FastX, et cetera, which use this idea of predicting words from their context, basically. But really, it's sort of the, this, this whole idea is completely taken off. So why does it work for natural, natural language processing, and why does it not work so well for, for in the context of images and vision? I think it's because of the sort of how we represent uncertainty or how we do not represent uncertainty. So let's say we want to do video prediction. We, um, we have short video clips with a few frames. In this case here, a little girl approaching a birthday cake. And then we ask the machine to predict the next few frames in the video. Uh, if you train a, a large neural net to predict the next few frames using least squared error, you know, squared error, um, what you get are blurry predictions. Why? Because the system cannot exactly predict what's gonna happen, and so it, the best thing it can do is predict the average of all the possible futures. To be more concrete, let's say all the videos consist of someone putting a pen on the table and letting it go, and every time you repeat the experiment, the pen falls in a different direction, and you can't really predict in which direction it's gonna fall. Then if you predict the average of all the outcomes, it would be a transparent pen, uh, you know, superimposed on itself in all possible orientations. And that's not a good prediction. So if you want a system to be able to represent multiple predictions, it has to have what's called a latent variable. So you have a function implemented by a neural net. It takes the past, let's say a few frames from a video, and it wants to predict the next few frames. It has to have an extra variable here, it's called z, 
so that when you vary this variable, the output varies over a particular set of plausible predictions. Okay, that's called a latent variable model. The problem with training those things is that there is basically only two ways of training them that we know about, or two kind of uh, families of, of, uh, of ways to train those systems. One is a very cool idea from uh, Ian Goodfellow and his collaborators at University of Montreal a few years ago called adversarial training or generative adversarial networks. And the idea of uh, 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 GANs, generative adversarial networks, is to train a second neural net to tell the first neural net whether its prediction is on this manifold or, or set of plausible futures or not. And you train those two networks simultaneously. Um, there's another technique that consists in sort of inferring what the ideal value of the latent variable would be to make a good prediction. But if you do this, you have the danger that the latent variable will capture all the information there is to, to capture about, about the prediction, and no information will actually be used from the past to make that prediction. So you have to regularize this latent variable. Okay, so um, those uh, ideas of things like uh, Adversarial training worked really well, so what you see here at the bottom is a video prediction for a small, a short clip where the system has been trained with this adversarial training. Uh, and there are you know, various ways of doing those uh, predictions, not just in pixel space, but also in the space of objects uh, that have been already segmented. Um, those adversarial, uh, generative adversarial networks uh, can generate uh, images that are used for kind of uh, assistance to sort of artistic production. So these are non-existing faces. You have a system here that's been trained to produce an image that looks like a celebrity. And after the system is trained, you feed it uh, a few hundred random numbers, and that comes a face that doesn't exist. And they look pretty good. This is work by NVIDIA from uh, this year, actually. It was presented this year. Um, you can use this to produce all kinds of different things, like you know, um, clothing, for example, training on a collection of uh, uh, clothes from a famous designer. Um, so I think we need sort of new ways of, uh, represent, of, of sort of formulating this problem of unsupervised learning so that our systems can deal with this uh, uncertainty in the prediction in the context of continuous high dimensional spaces. We don't have the problem in the context of um, uh, adversarial, of um, natural language processing because it's easy to represent the distribution over words it's just a discrete distribution. It's a long vector of numbers between 0 and 1 that sum to 1. But it's very hard in continuous high dimensional spaces. And so we need new techniques for this. And one technique I'm proposing is something called energy based uh, self supervised running, which is imagine that uh, your world is two dimensional. You only have two input variables, two sensors. And your entire uh, world, your entire training set, is composed of those dots here in this two dimensional space. Uh, what you'd like is to train a contrast function, let's call it an energy, that gives low energy to points that are on the manifold of data and higher energy outside. And there is basically a lot of research to do there to find the best method to do this. Uh, my favorite one is what I call regularized latent variable models, and we had some success about 10 years ago in using techniques of this type for learning features in a convolutional net completely unsupervised. Uh, what you see on the left here is uh, animation of a system that learns uh, basically oriented filters by just being trained with natural image patches to reconstruct those under sparsity constraints. Uh, and what you see on the right is uh, filters of a convolutional net that are learned um, in the same, uh, uh, with the same algorithm with different numbers of filters. Those things kind of work. They don't beat supervised learning if you have tons of data, but the hope is that they will reduce the amount of necessary labeled data. So I'm gonna end with um, an example of how to combine, combine all this to get a machine to learn something um, uh, useful like a, like a task, a motor task. Uh, so here what I'm, what I'm talking about is can we train a machine to learn to drive by just observing uh, other people driving and by training a model of uh, what goes on in the world. So you are in your car, you can see all the cars around you and if you can predict what the cars around you are gonna do ahead of time, then you can drive defensively, basically. You can, you can decide to stay away from this car because you see it swerving. You can decide to uh, you know, kind of slow down because the car in front of you is likely to, uh, to slow down because there's another car in front of it that is, is slowing down. So you have all those predictive models that uh, 
basically keep you safe and you've sort of learned to integrate them over time, you don't even have to think about it. You, it's just in your, in your sort of reflexes of, of driving. You can talk at the same time and, and you, you'll, you'll work. Um, but the way to train a system like this is you first have to train a forward model. So a forward model would be, uh, here is the state of the world at time t. Give me the, a prediction about the state of the world at time t plus one. And the problem with this, of course, is the world is not deterministic. There's a lot of things that could happen. So it's the same problem I was talking about with a pen. Many things can happen. So, but if you had such a forward model, you could run the forward model multiple time steps. And then if you had a, an objective function, like how far you are from the other cars, whether you are in lane, things like this, you could backpropagate gradient through this entire system to train a neural net to predict the correct course of action that would, uh, that would be safe over the long run. And this can be done completely in your head. If you have a forward model in your head, you don't have to actually drive to train yourself to drive. You can just imagine all of those things. So that's a specific example. So you put a camera looking down at a highway. It follows every car and it extracts a little rectangle around every car that follows every car that you see at the bottom. And, uh, and what you're doing now is you're training a convolutional net to take a few frames centered on a particular car and predict the next state of the world. And if you do this, um, you get, uh, oops, sorry. you get the second column. So the, the, the column on the left is what happens in the real world. The second column is what happens if you just train a convolutional net with least square to predict what's gonna happen. It can only predict the average of all the possible futures and so you get blurry predictions. If you now transform the model so it has a latent variable that allows it to take into account the uncertainty about the world, and I'm not going to explain exactly how that works, then you get the, the prediction that you just saw um, on, the, on the right where for every drawing of this latent variable, you get different predictions, but they're crisp. Okay, so now what you can do is, um, you can, to do this training I was telling you about earlier, you sample this latent variable, so you get different pos possible scenarios about what's gonna happen in your future, then through backpropagation, you train your policy network uh, to get your system to drive, and if you do this, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because the system goes into regions of the state space where you the forward model is very inaccurate and very uncertain. So what you have to do is add another term in the objective function that prevents the system from going into parts of the space where it doesn't, where its predictions are bad. Okay, so it's like an inverse curiosity uh, constraint if you want. And if you do this, it works. So these are examples of uh, the blue car is driving itself, the little white dot indicates whether it accelerates, whether it brakes or whether it turns, and it kind of keeps itself safe away from the other cars. The other cars can't see it. The blue car is invisible here. Uh, let me show you another example here. Um, so here the yellow car is the actual car in the video. The blue car is what the agent here that's been trained is, uh, is doing. And it's being squeezed between two cars so it has to escape because the other cars don't see it. So it has to squeeze out. Um, but it works, it works reasonably well. And basically that system has never interacted with the real world. It's just watched other people drive and then it's used that for, for training its uh, action plans, basically its policy. Okay, now I'm gonna go a little uh, uh, philo philosophical, if you want. Um, there is, tr throughout history of technology and science, there's been this phenomenon, it's not universal, but it's pretty frequent, where people invent an artifact and then derive a science out of this artifact to explain how this artifact works or to kind of, uh, uh, figure out its limitations. So a good example is the invention of the telescope uh, in the 1600s. Optics was not developed until at least 50 years later. Uh, but people had a good intuition of how to build telescopes before that. A steam engine was invented in the late 1600s, early 1700s. And thermodynamics was, you know, came up more than 100 years later, basically designed to uh, explain the limitations of thermal engines. And thermodynamics now is the foundation of one of the most fundamental intellectual construction of all science. Uh, so it was purposely defined to explain a particular artifact. That's very interesting. Um, same thing with electromagnetism and electrodynamics with uh, 
you know, the invention of sailboats and airplanes and aerodynamics, uh, uh, you know, invention of compounds and chemistry to explain, et cetera, right? Computers and computer science came after the invention of computers, right? Uh, information theory came after the invention of uh, first digital communication uh, through radio and teletype and things like that. So it's quite possible that now we have, you know, in the next few decades, we'll have empirical systems that are built by uh, trial and error, perhaps by systematic optimization on powerful machines, perhaps by intuitions, by uh, empirical work, perhaps with a little bit of theory, perhaps a lot of theory, hopefully. And the question is whether this will lead to uh, a whole theory of intelligence. The fact that we can build an artifact that is intelligent might lead to a general theory of information processing and intelligence. Um, and that's kind of uh, a big hope. Uh, I'm not sure this is gonna be realized over the next uh, few decades, but uh, that's a good program. A word of caution about biological inspiration. So neural nets are biologically inspired, conventional nets are biologically inspired, but they're just inspired, they're not copied. Um, let me give you a story of a gentleman called Clément Adair. Uh, is there any French people in the room here? Okay, can you raise your hand? French people, no French people? Yeah, okay, a couple. Have you heard of Clément Adair? Never heard of Clément Adair? Yeah, you have, okay. Is there anyone who is not French who has heard of Clément Adair? Okay, one person, two person. Basically nobody, you guys have no idea who he is, right? Okay, so this guy built in the late 1800 a bat-shaped airplane, steam-powered. He was a steam engine designer. And his airplane actually took off on its own power 13 years before the Wright brothers, uh, flew for about 50 meters at about 50 centimeters altitude, and then kind of crashed, landed. Um, it was basically uncontrollable. So basically the guy just copied bats and just assumed that because it has the shape of a bat, it would just fly, right? Uh, that seemed a little bit naive. It was not naive at all, but it was, it, it kind of, you know, stuck a little bit too close to biology and, and got sort of hypnotized by it a little bit and didn't do things like, you know, build a model or a glider or a kite or, you know, a wind tunnel like the, like the Wright brothers did. Um, so he, he stuck a little too close to biology. On the other hand, he had a big legacy, which is that his second airplane was called the Avion, and that's actually the word in French, uh, Spanish, and Portuguese uh, for airplane. So he had some legacy. Um, but he was kind of a secretive guy. He, you know, this was before the open source days. And so this is why you never heard of him. Thank you very much. <laughs>